Hello ELA A30 students, it's Mr. Judge here. Today we're talking about landscapes. If you look to your thematic questions, you'll find that uh, landscapes are the focus for the first few anyways. Um, the thematic questions for our first unit are things you should be going back to pretty frequently. frequently pardon me. What is a landscape? Uh, landscape is a place or environment with unique features or traits. So um, oftentimes my grade 10s and 11s will write about landscapes uh, and we'll just casually say the landscape or this is or landscapes often are but really we need to consider the fact that we use landscapes with a tied explanation so if I say the Canadian landscape is this uh, you know I'm probably going to address its physical features its natural physical features mountain ranges bodies of water uh, the northern territories a lot of the th things that come up when I start thinking about Can uh, Canada's landscape um, are natural so that would be its defining or unique features. Now that's a pretty grand landscape. Landscapes don't have to be so big. We can think of landscapes as smaller things that are um, more integral uh, to our day-to-day -day lives. So we're going to look at some examples in a bit that will reveal that. What's a natural, uh, natural landscape? Well, there's an easy way to determine it. Um, a natural landscape, of course, we'd have to think about the word natural itself. Natural means that it's got a very simple agenda to grow and survive. Um, and if there's been a human impact, then it's not natural. So has there been any human impact? Uh, if your answer is no, you've got yourself a natural landscape. It's pretty simple. And of course, if you answer yes, then you have a constructed landscape. Now, human impact varies. Uh, I think some people think human impact is a concrete jungle of a downtown core. But human impact can simply mean that you stop things from being how they were intended to be. So human impact can be power lines through a provincial park. Um, and of course, the fencing and the trails and the campsites that go within it. All of a sudden now you've taken a, a very natural place and you've given it so many constructed features. Um, it becomes more or less constructed. And we'll talk about a third maybe physical uh, landscape that might be able to be some middle ground for us and that'll come up in a bit. Uh, an example of a natural place might be a rainforest, a uh, waterfall, and if you've ever been to the Canadian uh, Niagara Falls then you know full well that uh, a waterfall can be all-consuming. It can take up the whole frame of a lens and it can be breathtaking and it is natural except for of course the boats and casinos that are built all around it. Uh, mountain range, body of water like Lake Superior, for all intents and purposes, and especially when you're in the middle of it, it would seem as though you are completely consumed by a natural place. The opposite, of course, constructed, takes many common forms. Uh, a cityscape like New York City uh, might be an example. And uh, another one could be a bridge. Um, I think that it's pretty important that we recognize Pardon me. It's pretty important that we recognize um, that something like uh, the Golden Gate Bridge is an all-consuming constructed um, figure that stands as pretty much a symbol for San Francisco's coastline. So that would be another example of a constructed landscape. Great Pyramid's a historical one, the English Channel's channel, uh, although obviously you're not going to see it when you fly over because it goes beneath the, the English Channel itself. Um, and it's several kilometers long. It is a constructed landscape that serves the purpose of transportation. So uh, what about a bike path that goes through a forest? Um, here's where I want you to consider some, A, this is not a philosophical question. This is not like if a tree falls in a forest and there's no one around to hear it, does it make a sound? Uh, this is a chance for you to think about how a bike path that serves people um, if it were to go through a forest, which serves a more natural and purpose of growth and survival, um, what would you have there? Well, you have two very different agendas. So with that clashing of agendas, you have a clashing landscape. Now, if you've got this note with you and you're filling it out as you go, that's great. Um, if you want to just revert to the, refer to this video as we go throughout this course, something you want to come back to, um, just keep in mind that a clashing and a constructed landscape are not the same. Um, obviously, any landscape, there's still the natural sky that's above us. But we're, we're talking about in terms of uh, land and how it's been impacted. We have to recognize our impact just as so many did before us. 
So what is the defining question for such a landscape? Has the natural intersected with the constructed? If it has, then you've got yourself a clashing landscape. Uh, there are lots of other examples you can probably think of. And for those of you who have been on vacations and trips with family, you've probably been to many places that, although they're majestic and beautiful, uh, there are trails leading to, uh, to, uh, to and from it. And I'm sure that you've probably been to places too where um, you know, a pier or a dock seems to have interrupted a natural and beautiful coastline. Uh, I've been to New Zealand before and they have uh, Abel Tasman Park, which is a beautiful area uh, right, right in the middle of Abel Tasman Park. They've got strings of uh, bridges, walking bridges that seem to nearly pollute the park itself. Uh, and it's a coastal marine park. So it's pretty interesting how we sometimes think the natural um, can be with human impact present, but it can't be. Uh, it's got to be something in the middle between natural and constructed, and that is, in fact, a clashing landscape. However, if we go beyond just the physical, and we consider cultural elements, we consider people and how they're organized within it, we come to what's called a social landscape. So a social landscape has to have a physical place. More importantly, um, of course, inside that physical place, whether it be natural or constructed, um, there needs to be humans organized somehow within it. Uh, so how are people organized or how are humans organized should be the better question there. And of course, it needs to all serve a cultural agenda. If I went to the IPLEX, the IPLEX is a constructed place and people are organized um, by vendors at the front. Um, we've got officials on the ice, players on the ice, fans in the stands. We've got people recording it. There is organization all around. Despite the chaos that might be during a Broncos game, there is a great deal of organization in terms of structure and roles that all take place within it. And of course, the cultural agenda for a Broncos game is recreation. Um, and if not recreation, then of course, for people who like to be fans in the stands, uh, maybe there's even a consumerist aspect uh, to the idea of following a uh, sports team. So let's take this to more of a day-to-day -day application for you. Consider school. School is a constructed landscape. Um, it is built, there are walls, and it serves with utility and functionality and hopefully durability. Hopefully walls don't come crashing down inside our school. And of course, within that, there's a hierarchy of importance. Students come first. Uh, teachers need to teach them. They need to be supported by administration and the building they work in needs custodial and maintenance staff. Without all these people and stakeholders, it is a purposeless constructed environment. And of course, the cultural agenda at public school in Canada is learning. And you say, well, how is learning cultural? Learning happens all around the world. Yeah, but Western learning is a little bit unique, isn't it? Uh, it's not the same as you're going to find if you travel all the way around the world and you go to Bali or if you go to, you know, Thailand. Learning looks different. Uh, we might still have students that are confined to a school, but maybe the agendas of their geography classes are different than yours. Their social science classes appeal to different things. When people walk in our school and they see students sitting on the ground in the hallway working collaboratively on something, that doesn't happen everywhere. So the cultural agenda or mandate for learning is different in school here than it is in other places, still learning. But think about maybe what makes our westernized version of learning unique and different. Um, and you could probably define this with a great deal more than just the word learning. You could say uh, structured learning environments that involve inquiry-based research and student needs and voices put at the forefront. And that would probably better capture our cultural agenda at school here. Starbucks, the great Starbucks. Um, if you want to pay for an overpriced latte, go to this constructed place. You'll find yourself a customer being served by baristas. And of course, the cultural end is many, or there are many rather. Uh, there's consumerism as a cultural end, capitalism, and of course, socializing in the public sphere. People meet at Starbucks to catch up, to see each other. Uh, some people meet new people there, and some people are there to confine themselves to the online uh, life that they have. You'll ever if you ever walk into a Starbucks, there's usually someone accessing the Wi-Fi. If you're either doing some learning themselves or they're meeting someone online or they're doing research or they're just doing some shopping. But there is a cultural agenda there um, that is unique probably to the Western world more than a lot of other places. So um, it's safe to say that a lot of cultural agendas are universal. Um, what I'd like you to do, though, is think about a few other places within Swift Current um, that have 
a physical landscape you can identify as either constructed or natural that have human organization whereby you can label roles or structure. Uh, that could be a hierarchy of structure, it's up to you. And then of course the cultural agenda. So try that for just three more. So take out uh, or pop open rather the uh, Google Doc that I've included with uh, this first task uh, for unit B of the greater unit, which is uh, landscapes diverse dynamic for this uh, first unit of e ELA 30 and see if you can um, better understand the concept by applying it to what you know in your own city. Um, and if by all means you have any questions, just email me. Uh, this will serve you really well for our next activity, which is uh, constructing a landscape photo collection. So that's going to involve some of uh, these terms that you return to and you revisit for the sake of knowing what it is you're going to photograph. Let me know if you have questions, though. Take care.